to introduce Stellar to you. And uh, Stellar is currently a research fellow uh, at the Studio for Creative Inquiry here in CFA. And he is currently in the third year of the prestigious Australian Council Fellowship. Um, Stellar is a Greek born Australian national who has lived 20 years in Japan. Uh, he is a performance artist that uh, has been well known in, in art circles and certainly beyond for its unique and daring qualities, beginning with the early suspension pieces and uh, he's been exploring the body with technology, robotics, VR, internet, to extend the performance capability of the body. He has filmed inside the body with his internal sculpture, and he's built uh, the state-of-the-art third hand, which is here with us today, which has been state-of-the-art for uh, 15 years or so now. Um, he's expanded. <laughs> Shakespeare. Uh, he's expanded his work recently uh, into areas that have uh, been of interest to music and dance, and that is the amplification, the body signals, and the choreography of the body with the stimulation systems. The last two or three years, uh, he's been involved with the internet and has produced uh, remote choreography of body. So why, why do we have Stellar here? Of course, he's with us at the studio um, at this event. Jill Watson, who I knew uh, briefly, all too briefly, um, was very interested in structures and she seemed to have the ability to critique and delighted to critique the structures from the outside. She had uh, the bit of the iconoclast in her and uh, it's that unique, indomitable spirit that Jill displayed that I think um, we find a kindred spirit here in Stellar. And that's one really wonderful reason that we allow him to kick off this event. So, uh, or uh, shake your hand, so to speak. So, Stellar. Good. Thanks very much, uh, John, and, and thank you for inviting me to participate. Um, John's assured me that this microphone also filters out my Australian accent, <laughs> so all you guys should be able to fully understand me. Um, when I did a presentation in Exxon Provence, um, uh, a couple of uh, girl students stayed behind to have a talk, and um, after a while I noticed that one of the girls in fact had a cosmetic arm, had, had, a, had an artificial arm. Didn't work, but uh, being an art student, she was very interested in uh, trying the third hand, and I attached some electrodes on her other arm, and she was delighted to, to activate the mechanism. And um, at the end of this uh, little demonstration, I guess she so, sort of felt, uh, you know, gratitude and, and, and said, well, you know, I have several other of these artificial arms, and would you like one of my arms? <laughs> and, um, well, I kind of nervously sort of said, well, yes, it, it, is, a, it is a beautiful arm. And, uh, <laughs> without, without further hesitation, she sort of twisted it off the stump of her, of her arm and handed it over. Now, it was rather embarrassing, because here was this guy with four arms, <laughs> and um, the girl was walking away with one. Um, so I, I did sort of call her back and insist that she have her arm back. But it sort of uh, prompted me to think uh, about the body as a structure. Um, for the last sort of 2,000 years of Western philosophy and metaphysics, we've, we've seen the body as a kind of object of desire. And here, here we had a body that was partially redesigned. So I saw the body as a structure, as a space, uh, not merely as a site for inscription, but rather a body that uh, uh, designed in different ways might affect identity and might affect our, our notions of self. 
Uh, Drew Lager in his book, uh, The Absent Body, points out how uh, we've evolved as absent bodies. In other words, because our sensory antennae are uh, externally oriented into the world, because we often uh, behave habitually and automatically, um, we tend to operate as if we were minds in the world, and our physicality tends to recede. So this, this notion of evolving as an absent body um, generates this feeling of, 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 of being uh, a mind, a self in the world. It sort of seductively erases um, the kind of duality that Plato and, and Descartes uh, postulated. So for me it's a very interesting notion. But having evolved an absent body, uh, we now have a body that is uh, fundamentally obsolete. It's obsolete in form, in function, and it's incapable of operating um, at the technological speeds and uh, the scales that go beyond uh, the human sensory spectrum. So we have to consider now the design of the body and how to better interface it with its technological terrain because it somehow has to cope with speeds beyond its metabolism, uh, beyond its circadian rhythms. Now, having evolved as an absent body and become obsolete, uh, the body now is invaded by technology. Uh, the body now becomes a host for technological components. Whereas technology begins as an external phenomenon to the body, um, with increasing miniaturization, technology lands on the skin and now is even being implanted, safely guided inside the body. So technology is no longer a container, but perhaps a component of the body. One that uh, leads us into certain possible futures, uh, like, like uh, Donna Haraway's cyborgian uh, body. Can we start with the first video, please? <coughs> So the body plugged in into its natural landscape is a body uh, that has evolved with certain constraints, with a certain kind of existence, an existence that begins in birth uh, and ends in death. Um, this uh, performance um, in Australia was one using a virtual arm, um, an arm that is uh, activated by a pair of data gloves so you need two physical arms to control your virtual arm and in a sense here the body uh, becomes a host for a phantom entity not one that is experienced uh, with an amputee when that amputee has a phantom limb effect but here this phantom entity is in addition to the, to the body um, it's generated as, an ex as a kind of an extension to the body. Um, these earlier suspensions involved exploring the physical and psychological limits of the body. Here the body is um, uh, counterbalanced by a ring of rocks. In a tensegrity icosahedron, where the tension of the cables holds the body are suspended in place within the structure. And in New York, uh, between two buildings over a street, um, I had a good view of the police cars that was, were coming from all directions. <laughs> and, uh, uh, what was planned to be a 30 minute performance uh, uh, was over in about 12 minutes. Um, but as the policeman pulled me into the window, uh, he insisted on seeing my ID, which was a really, a really difficult thing to produce under the circumstances. <laughs> um, the third hand begins as a visual attachment to the body. It's produced uh, as a means of increasing the body's performance capabilities.
and uh, here the body is uh, was doing a series of drawing and writing uh, performances where here the body is writing one word uh, simultaneously with the three hands, uh, each hand writing a separate letter at the same time. I'll demonstrate the third hand towards the end of the presentation, but it's controlled ordinarily by electrodes on the abdominal and leg uh, muscles, allowing individual movement of, of, of the three hands. The idea that an absent, obsolete and invaded body uh, comes into being is one that uh, we need to question very, very carefully. Um, we talked uh, in, 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 a, in, a, in, in our cyber body session the other day about um, the experiences, the pathological experiences of, of um, uh, glove anesthesia, losing uh, all feeling in your arm. Uh, the pathological condition called alien hand, where your hand, your arm does things involuntarily um, uh, uh, and, and does it often to your detriment. Um, so this idea of a, of a virtual arm was an idea to augment that um, a range of experiences, but rather than experience as a pathology, this is experienced as an addition and extension of the physical body into the um, uh, computer network. Um, next uh, video, please. Okay. Could we put the uh, in body uh, software on? At the same time that I was uh, uh, performing with laser beams projected from the eyes, scanning and scribbling in the space, um, I did a performance uh, several years ago for the 5th Australian Sculpture Triennale. And when I was last at Carnegie Mellon and gave a presentation, I was talking about doing this but not having yet done it. And um, in this performance, um, uh, we constructed uh, a little robotic mechanism that was inserted inside the body. A little capsule structure that opens and closes, extends and retracts, has a flashing light and a beeping sound. And um, uh, here we're testing the mechanism. The plastic mouth guard is to prevent me uh, biting on the control cables and um, doing damage to the to the control system, and you can see the flashing light up top there, um, and soon the uh, sculpture will be inserted. The theme of the 5th Australian Sculpture Triennale was site-specific works. <laughs> <laughs> I've never been in a sculpture triennale before, so I was, I was quite desperate. And I thought, that being a performance artist, how, how would one uh, relate uh, a sculpture intimately with the body? And, and I used uh, such, because these proposals were evaluated by, by a committee, and I, I, used, I used such reasoning as, well, this wouldn't take up any more museum space. <laughs> um, it was very small and wouldn't be expensive to fabricate. That actually was a lie because in the end I needed the assistance of a, of a, a, of a, of a jeweller to make the shell of the device and a microsurgery instrument maker to uh, fabricate the internal linkage of the worm screw mechanism, which was really too small to do unless um, it was done un under magnification. Uh, so uh, this, I guess, was a was a gesture to the idea that technology can be inhabiting the body. Um, with the development of nanotechnology, we're going to be able to uh, build machines, build uh, micro miniaturized robots that, in fact, will uh, be small enough to inhabit cellular spaces and internal tracts of the body. A kind of viral technology 
that may lay dormant inside your body and unless a pathological change in chemistry or heat might trigger that little microenteride robot to perform or signal or alert uh, us externally that something is wrong. So we might be able to recolonize the human body with microminiaturized robots to augment about our bacterial and viral populations. You see here I, I consider the body as a kind of architectonic space, as a structure. Um, in this case, the body is a host, not for a spirit, not for a platonic spirit or a Cartesian self, but simply for a sculpture. The body becomes a host uh, for a work of art, an aesthetic addition to the body, not uh, a prosthetic or, or medical replacement of some malfunctioning part of, 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 um, of, of your body structure. So this uh, idea of, of um, making an internal sculpture um, had those sorts of reasonings in mind. The design of the sculpture had to be um, complex enough to be interesting, but simple enough so that it wouldn't malfunction. We had to come up with ways by which, and with a logic circuit, uh, we could control the servo motor. Um, let me sort of catch up with some of the slides here. This is the, the uh, uh, sculpture itself. Um, open, it's the size of a small fist. But of course it had to be closed in a capsule structure so that it could be safely inserted inside the body. And um, uh, okay. so here you see the, the size relative to, to the uh, mount. It's about uh, open, it's 75 millimeters long by 50 millimeters in diameter. It's made of gold, stainless steel, silver, in other words, non-corrosive biocompatible materials. Initially, I had thought that if I could make some of the components of the sculpture uh, out, of, out of copper, uh, this would react with the hydrochloric acidic contents of my stomach <laughs> and produce a primitive battery that would, would, would sort of drive the mechanism. Um, unfortunately, I didn't foresee the fact that this would also uh, give my stomach a copper coating. Uh, so <laughs> So it wasn't such a bright idea after all, and we had to resort to an external power supply um, where you, you saw the, the control box later on. But you can see here, it's with a, a worm screw and link mechanism, and um, this was made uh, to the largest size possible to uh, insert down the esophagus and get it safely into the stomach cavity. The idea was that this would fill a lot of the stomach cavity when it was fully opened. And of course, we required um, a separate endoscope to, you can see there the control cable, which is the, the, the colored cable, and then the black cable is the endoscope, which actually um, is filming. And you can see here the, the top of the sculpture, uh, the top part of the sculpture. Of course, we had trouble filming it uh, clearly inside the body because the body wants to produce fluids and mucus and all this sort of stuff. Um, so, uh, but there has been a second sculpt, internal sculpture planned and has already been made. And I found that you can take a medication that will dry up the inside of the body for several hours so we can film it really clearly. There are side effects though to this medication. Uh, this medication will produce an amnesia. So having done the performance, I won't remember having done it. Uh, but hopefully this will lead to better documentation overall. The wireframe uh, simulation... The wireframe simulation just uh, uh, gives you an idea of, of how the sculpture was being tracked inside the body. You can see the control cable there. And... Um, uh, Hopefully, this will uh, this second insertion will, will take place. A clean shot of the inside of the stomach. Um, I filmed about three meters of internal space into the stomach, colon, intense, uh, and lungs. Um, and when we made uh, this particular uh, microfilm shot, 
uh, what began as, as, as an artistic experiment quickly deteriorated into this medical melodrama when uh, the researchers discovered a polyp growing in my stomach and we had to perform... <laughs> It wasn't funny at the time. <laughs> we had to perform a biopsy there and then, uh, fortunately it was benign, uh, but the uh, researcher said that he could uh, roughly tell the age of a person by counting the rings of growth in their stomach. Okay. Can we have the next videotape please? <laughs> Um, in in um, recent years, I've been increasingly interested in the idea of the body uh, being uh, stimulated by uh, 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 electrical voltage. Um, in this performance, which was done in, in, in London, uh, we used a, a flock of birds uh, a magnetic uh, position orientation system uh, and in this performance, the body is actually uh, um, performing with a, a virtual body. So, uh, using the flock of bird sensors, you can map your physical movements onto, onto this virtual body and using <coughs> a pre-programmed uh, uh, industrial robot, which was which is scanning and rotating around the body. Now, the movements that my body is making are involuntary. So here you have a situation where this absent, obsolete, invaded body is now performing involuntarily um, and uh, having to perform with a pre-programmed robot um, and uh, laser beams are, are being uh, uh, modulated from the eyes using optic fibre cable and a collimating lens system um, and we also had amplified body signals and sounds like brainwaves, heartbeat, uh, blood flow and um, muscle signals. So that the performance is uh, structured uh, acoustically as well as, as, well as visually. Um, it, was, it is possible in these performances for me to interactively interrupt the robot's program and insert my body's subroutine. Uh, but, um, this caused a rather unpredictable and dangerous situation when uh, after the robot plays out your subroutine it wants to automatically go back to the point of interruption of, of its program and it generally does is taking the shortest route in the quickest possible way <laughs> so um, half of this performance was kind of controlling the robot and the other half was trying to avoid being hit by it <laughs> Uh, we can, though, uh, uh, having developed a, a muscle stimulation system, um, it wasn't a big leap. Uh, by the way, here's the, the body mapping that you can sort of uh, uh, witness there. There was a camera also at the end of the robot arm, uh, and sometimes sensors on the body limb to access that camera. But having plugged a, a computer into the mu this muscle stimulation system wasn't a, a great leap of the imagination to now uh, connect it to a modem and in fact uh, remotely uh, choreograph the body's movements. Can we have the next videotape please? So what you have here is a situation where people in other places can access your body and remotely control it or remotely choreograph it. Uh, for a performance uh, 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 at Kelly Polis um, in Luxembourg a couple of years ago, we electronically linked the Pompidou Centre in Paris, the Media Lab in Helsinki, and the Doors of Perception Conference in Amsterdam. People in those three cities could access uh, this body in Luxembourg and make it move involuntarily. We had a picture tell ISDN link between these sites. So I could see the face of the person who was moving me. They could uh, see uh, their, uh, my involuntary movements or their choreography. 
what's happening here is not so much that there is a desire to remote control another body elsewhere, but rather that a movement you produce in your body is manifested in someone else's body in, an, in, 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 an, in another city. In other words, from your point of view, you can extrude your awareness and action into other bodies elsewhere. From this body's point of view, this body becomes a host for the behaviour of remote agents. Not remote agents on the internet, but rather remote presences, other people in other places. Last year there was a series of performances called uh, Ping Body where instead now of uh, developing software where people could access your body and prompt you to move, here software was developed using the Ping protocol in Unix so that the body could move to the ebb and flow of internet activity itself. So we were pinging randomly and continuously uh, over 40 global locations. The information that we were getting back in milliseconds was then mapped to the different body, uh, body muscles. So the body was moving not to the promptings of other people but to the data flow um, uh, over the internet using this rather crude ping uh, reverberating sort of system. Okay, can we uh, switch to the, um, uh, to the video now, thank you. And for these upcoming performances, um, uh, beginning in Glasgow in a, in a couple of weeks, uh, there, there will be a performance where we're now completing software we're developing search engines that will scan, display and select uh, bits of images and bits of sound from the net, telematically scaling the optical and acoustical inputs of the body uh, to internet data. So in other words, the body's input, the body's sensory um, input will not be limited to the real world but will be artificially induced uh, by, by the net. And um, uh, uh, this will also affect uh, the body uh, in terms of its proprioception as well as its sensory input. Um, the uh, software that we're displaying here is indicative of the, the sort of information and the software interface for the ping body and, and you can see that it's just a, a very simple uh, graphical interface um, but of course it has to sort of run in real time and um, uh, we're using a combination of, of Unix and uh, a, a, a Mac director driven um, system. The muscle stimulation system is only a one way system at the moment um, and it's only six channels, but it's not so difficult to make it a two-way setup. So, for example, instead of uh, one person affecting the movements of another person in, 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 in um, only one way, there'll be a possibility of interactive uh, physical coupling of bodies. Um, and the, sto uh, the story that brings this, uh, uh, or that brings this really home, is the story. Um, uh, with a, a Sandy Stone at the a Melbourne Medical Conference when uh, she prompted me, she's a, a post-operative transsexual and was interested in the cybersexual uh, implications of such a system and uh, I hadn't thought of it at that time but uh, when she asked what, what sort of uh, possibilities there might be I thought well if Sandy's in New York and this body is in Melbourne touching my chest in Melbourne 
would prompt Sandy to caress her breast in New York. Now, if you were watching Sandy, you would see this as an act of self-gratification, as, as a sort of a masturbatory action. But Sandy would know that her hand was remotely and, and perhaps even divinely guided. <laughs> So you have a situation here where if, if I touch my skin here, I would feel this touch coming from another body in another place, looping back to this body as a secondary and, augment, or, and augmenting sensation, which would sort of be an intriguing experience of that remote presence. And given that, there would be adequate feedback loops and ultimately tactile and force feedback, then we would create powerful phantom presences of that remote body. And your, your physical body would have a kind of phantom companion, you know, a kind of electronic shadow uh, that um, uh, creates the presence of that remote person and, and kind of um, enables it to interface with, with, with your neural system. What's seductive about this muscle stimulation system is that it's not some exoskeleton that is moving your body around, but rather an, an electrical flow which is initiated in one place uh, via the internet, uh, flows into the nerve endings of your body and contracts your, your muscles and you move. So that sort of system, uh, for me, is a very seductive one because it's a seamless, it becomes a seamless interface. I'd like to demonstrate uh, uh, a couple of things. Uh, firstly, how this hand uh, operates. So I know some of you may have seen it before, but uh, I was assured there'd be a number of newcomers. <clears throat> I'm not fully wired up. It's very difficult to be fully wired up with clothes on. But, um, I've got electrodes on my arms which will partially show the operation of this hand. And if I switch it on, I can, of course, uh, control it with, with uh, the switching mechanism, or I can control it with my muscle signals. Okay? Now, I'm not fully wired up, so uh, I'm only operating properly with two channels, but I don't even have to move my hand to get it to open. All I'm doing is produce, producing a signal from the appropriate muscle internally to activate the mechanism. So it's an EMG muscle interface control system. Um, and um, uh, this hand has a, a, a pinch release, a grasp release a 300 degree wrist rotation clockwise and anti-clockwise and a tactile feedback system for a sense of touch. Um, that touch is only a crude sense because it, you really need uh, the, uh, a sort of, uh, the level of a light pinch before you get feedback. Uh, but nonetheless, it, it is a crude and effective tactile feedback system. I will have this mechanism on display at the Studio for Creative Inquiry this afternoon, so if you want to have a closer look at it, um, please come along and see. It has, has a rather uh, intriguing little flip-flop mechanism that allows the engagement or disengagement of the thumb. So it's, although it's only two, two degrees of freedom, relatively simple in operation, uh, with the flip-flop mechanism, if the thumb is not engaged, it's a, it's a grasp. If the thumb is engaged, it becomes a pinch. So it's a rather clever way of getting around uh, just simply having two degrees of freedom. Um, we've also wired up... Uh, can we unplug the sound off for that? Thanks. Okay, safely unplug it now. Um, we've wired up um, a, a group of four people uh, to demonstrate the muscle stimulation system. Now, we're not going to wire them into the, uh, the large box here simply because I would have to open it up and um, adjust the threshold levels 
a, a, a leech fighting, that, that gets a bit awkward. Um, but you can see here as, as the control signals, the serial port signals are coming from the computer, it's only on simulation, but if we had a live internet connection, you would get um, an actual internet uh, data feed and, and, and motion of the body. You can see the, the box uh, switching on and off appropriately. Uh, but I've got a little medical uh, stimulator which will demonstrate the kind of involuntary movements uh, that are possible. So if you guys come, come to the front and I'll bring this around. Uh, and um, Nathan, you need to be this end. Nathan's arm's going to lift up so we don't want him to sort of hit anyone in the process. Okay, so uh, if you guys can sort of step back a little bit so people at the side can see, but sort of step back a little bit, but keep close together because these cables are not very long. But um, this muscle stimulator isn't programmable at the moment, so the movements will be slow, but it does give some sort of an idea, and I'll just sort of duck down out of the way. Okay, now the movements that the people are making are involuntary. Now, you can see this, depending on where the, where the um, uh, uh, stimulator pads on, determines where... Okay, there's this beautiful hand movement here. So given, you know, a, a 20 or 30 degree um, stimulation system, then you could choreograph uh, rather complex and subtle movements, include of, including uh, finger motions um, and, and more complex rotational limb movements. Now, the voltage is only being um, adjusted high enough so that it will generate a movement and, but not leave them feeling too uncomfortable. Uh, but uh, at this lower stimulation level, perhaps it would be possible to resist the stimulation. But as the voltage increases, um, you can't possibly resist that. You know, you do perform involuntarily. And it's a kind of, I guess, a, what's intriguing for me is the idea of having a split physiology. Whereas in the past, we've had a kind of uh, pathological attitude, medically, to having a split personality. Um, here is a situation where it'll be an advantage to have a split physiology, where a part of your body can be remotely guided by a remote agent elsewhere. The other half of your body could locally collaborate and uh, 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 perform with this remote agent. <laughs> okay, I'll switch you guys off. I guess what's intriguing with using the internet here is not to see the internet any longer as merely a mode of information transfer, whether it's sort of um, uh, textual or visual, but to see the, the internet as a kind of <coughs> the possibility, as a kind of an external nervous system for the body. Um, an external nervous system that can stimulate the proprioception, the, the, mu the, the muscle movements of the body. Um, uh, an external nervous system that can provide um, uh, uh, visual and acoustical <coughs> input. Um, so the body has a kind of parasitic relationship uh, to the internet. So I guess I, what I've done here is, 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 is map out the different sorts of 
performances that have been possible using technology, where technology has been attached to the body, as with the third hand, uh, technology has been inserted inside the body, as with the internal sculpture that we saw, and being uh, connected to the internet where the body becomes part of a, of a sort of a, an extended operational system. An, an operational system where other bodies can perform with it in a kind of fractal flesh sort of a way. In other words, you can extrude your awareness into other bodies and bits of bodies spatially distributed but electronically connected over the internet. Um, I'd like to leave it at that. I don't know how we're going for time. It's uh, possibly a few, a few more minutes. Um, and uh, it, would, it would be beauty if, um, if people might ask questions or uh, have queries uh, about, about some of these, um, how some of these things have worked or in terms of the performances themselves. So are, are there any questions, please? Yes? You've used your body as a host um, a number of times. Um, if you, and you were discussing um, uh, the scientific disorder of the Canadian man. Yes. Um, have you found that you have reached a uh, state where um, you've lost control of your physical body? <laughs> um, the, the question uh, was whether, whether there's been a situation where you've sort of lost, totally lost control. I, I mean, I feel out of control in most of these performances, but um, um, it, it's, 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 it's interesting because when you get to a certain complexity of interaction, um, it's no longer an issue of who's in control, you know, because, because there's um, a number of feedback loops occurring and this interactivity is happening all the time, in real time, between you, um, the technology, you over the internet, the experience is more that the body becomes a kind of uh, an extended operational system. And so it's no longer an issue of master-slave mechanism or, or being in or out of control, but rather this sort of symbiotic experience that you sometimes have, that when you're, you may be driving along the, the freeway and all of a sudden you realise that you haven't been sort of fully aware of what you're doing. In other words, you sort of... The symbiosis is so seductive that, um, that you don't have a, a separation of your body awareness from the vehicle or from the, the, the overall situation. What about, what about the um, dashing of the vehicle? What about the electronic Well, I've never had a purely biological situation like, a, you know, an out-of-body experience or, or, or something like that. But, you know, I think with all of these performances, they were done in such a way that there was no um, uh, um, sort of outmoded metaphysical kind of assumptions or expectations or urge for transcendence or for any kind of spiritual kind of yearning. So, in other words, you do these performances being open to the experience and the interface, but trying not to foreclose on what might happen. Yes? It might, it might help, I know because I've got a microphone and you guys don't, so maybe if you can kind of like yell out the question, maybe some, some others can hear it. Yes? Do you plan on uh, using the new cochlear implant technology to sort of alter the sense of hearing or something like that? Well, I'd certainly be, uh, I'm certainly having a look at uh, these new, like for example now that you can get electrodes that are that can be implanted against the retina of, of the eye, so you can have almost direct um, electrical stimulation of the retina. Um, you can sort of internalise some of this hearing technology. So I'm certainly trying to sort of keep, keep up with the state of art of miniaturisation and um, looking at how this might be used. But of course, these are the actions of an artist, uh, not kind of pseudo-scientific research. Um, I'm much more interested in the kind of, in the aesthetic interfaces and, and the kind of alternate forms of, of awareness that are possible rather than sort of 
any reductive and, and, and focused uh, scientific uh, research. Yes? Um, in one of these scenarios where your body is being remotely controlled, how do you handle uh, muscular pain? Right. How, how does the person who is controlling you avoid uh, overstressing? Yeah, of course, you have to, you have to within the system, determine the, the sort of upper and lower limits of, 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 of stimulation intensity. So obviously, I wouldn't leave it totally up to you to keep turning up the voltage. <laughs> in, in, the, in, the history, in the history of scientific research, it's been found that people are all but willing to keep turning up the voltage. <laughs> um, but of course, um, uh, what would be uh, rather wonderful would be that you would be kind of wired up with, say, an infrared system whereby coming into the proximity of a computer would enable a kind of instant internet connection um, and the possibility of, of, um, of, of uh, downloading another body from another place. But of course, you'd have a series of, of, of kind of uh, choices along that, um, in that sort of menu of interactivity that would allow you to um, like, like, for example, you might be startled by a remote whisper, or you might be sort of prompted by a remote uh, person. But whether you then decide to engage in that interactive um, um, uh, performance with that other person would then depend on further steps that you take. Switch this on, uh, raise the level of the voltage, etc. But you have to certainly have something built into the system. Yes? Yes. Yes, but of course we have to have... Yes, we could do it that way. Um, and uh, if you like, we can try sometime in the studio. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad you asked and no one else did. <laughs> um, but I think that's, that's an interesting uh, possibility, that, that kind of uh, looping between uh, body machine and other, another body. Uh, well, not unless we can do it with ESP or, 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 or well, we could probably do it if we were close enough. <laughs> but uh, that's, that's, that's the sort of biological way of doing it. And um, I guess what's interesting for me is not so much the kind of, the kind of evolutionary attributes that we already have. In other words, in this kind of a system, you can have an intimacy without proximity. You can have, uh, you can have a, a kind of a physical um, uh, relationship with another person in another place without skin interface, without being in the same space. <coughs> one last one? Yes, hello. Uh, I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah. Can, can you explain what effect um, these performances and experiments have had on your own personal um, <laughs> understanding of interaction, human-human, <laughs> non-wired? <laughs> I thought you were going to say, you know, what discernible effects they've had on, on this body personally. And I was going to say the only discernible effect has been a loss of hair. <laughs> <laughs> but I think, um, I, I think the, 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 uh, to answer this, this, uh, your question seriously, I think this has probably been influenced also by my stay in Japan. <clears throat> because having lived in Japan, um, you know, Japan isn't essentially a kind of ego-driven society. It's a society where um, often decisions are made in groups, and um, a group meeting is not doesn't result in a compromise. It results in a consensus. Um, so that, taking in that mentality, which I didn't do consciously, but I think living there for 20 years it certainly had an effect. But I think it's, it's um, the more performances I do, the less and less I think 
I have a mind of my own, or even that I have a mind at all, in, in the traditional metaphysical sense. Now, I know some people will readily agree with me on that one, in a derogatory sense, but uh, I think there are, <coughs> there are several ways that one can construct intelligence and awareness. Uh, the, the Western way is to construct intelligence and awareness as that which happens within each body. A kind of very Protestant view, you know, a very individual view. In other words, um, um, this body is driven by an internal self, an, a, a, an ego. Um, on the other hand, one could construct intelligence and awareness as that which happens between you and me in the medium of language within which we communicate, uh, in this particular and peculiar culture within which we inhabit, um, at this point in time in history, in this corner of the universe, and so on, depending on our sort of frame of reference. So I would say that the, that's been the most discernible effect, the kind of shift from seeing the body as an individual unit to considering it a much more interactive, uh, interconnected uh, component in a much larger system of awareness and intelligence. And perhaps we should stop at that uh, because our time's up. Thank you very much.